present Arthur Lowe, John LeMessurier, and Clive Dunn in Dad's Army. The Two and a Half Covers, featuring John Laurie, Arnold Ridley, and Ian Lavender, with this week's guests, Bill Pertwee, Michael Bates, Larry Martin, and Avril Angles. Here is the news, and this is John Snag reading it. By the autumn of 1942, almost the whole of the continent of Europe is under the sway of the former Lance Corporal and one-time house painter from Bavaria, Adolf Schickelgruber. But our island fastest, thanks in no small way to the gallant efforts of the Home Guard, remains inviolate. Down at Warmington-on-Sea, three members of the local platoon, Captain Mannering, Sergeant Wilson and Private Pike, are preparing to fortify the inner man in their local British restaurant. What are you going to have today, Wilson? Well, I, I think I'd rather fancy the toad in the hole, sir. Mm. Fish and potato pie for me, I think. Oh. You were always one for adventure, weren't you, sir? <laughs> right, who's next? I am. Do you want soup? No, thank you, no. I'll just have the toad in the hole, please. Right, here we are. One toad in the hole. Excuse me, what, what sort of fish is it? It's snook. I beg your pardon? I say it's snook. Are you deaf or something? In that case, I think I'll have the toad in a hole. I wish you'd make your mind up. Right, next. Could I have fish pie, please? One fish pie coming up. <coughs> what sort of fish is it, please? It's snook. Oh, I think I'll have toad in the hole. <laughs> Love me another one. The fish pie is snook. Has everybody got that? It's snook. And don't forget to take your dirties back to the hatch when you're finished. I always do. Oh, no, you don't. You left them on the table yesterday. I've got enough to do without clearing up your dirty. Now, look here, my good woman. I... Wilson, for goodness sake, go and sit down. <laughs> Make an exhibition of yourself. Well, well, but I do hate rudeness. Excuse me. Excuse me. Excuse me, Mr. Mannering. What are you doing, Walker? There shan't be a second. Hello, Edna, darling. Hello, Mr. Walker, dear. You got my steak? Steak? <laughs> That's what I said. It's all ready for you, Mr. Walker. Medium rare, just as you like it. Lovely. <laughs> Hey, uh, what would you like with it? Oh, just a few spots and carrots. Oh, right you are, Mr. Walker. <laughs> <laughs> just a minute, just, 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 just a minute, Walker. Why the serving you with steak? Would it not? I brought it in early for them to cook for me. Oh, Edna. Here you are, love. Here's the elastic, I promise you. Oh, Tom, Mr. Walker. <laughs> Can't have him falling down on the job, can we, Mr. Manning? <laughs> have a care, Walker. You can't go flaunting your black market food all over the place. It'll give the platoon a bad name. Now, look, I don't want to be rude, Mr. Mannering, but I am not wearing a uniform and I'm not on parade. And what is more, I am a customer at your bank with over 1,500 nicker in a deposit account. So if you don't mind, I will go and eat my dinner. It's 1,542, actually. That'll do, Pike. <laughs> I say, Wilson. Hmm? Have you seen that enormous steak Walker's got? Yes, it looks delicious. Excuse me, Mr. Manning, can you move up, please? No, don't sit here, Pike. Go down to the other end of the table with Walker. Oh, all right, then. <laughs> Out of the rank and file, eating with us, Wilson. <laughs> Bad for discipline. Well, I gather in the German army, all ranks eat together. I'm afraid that doesn't impress me very much. Let's look at this toad, Wilson. Mm. <laughs> Scarcely more than a mouthful. I'm in somewhat of a dilemma here, sir. I don't know whether to eat my toad first or save it till the end. <laughs> Good morning, all. Good morning, Joe. Blimey, he's a chocolate soldier. Look at that uniform. <laughs> Hello, Joe. Hello, Pikey. You needn't have dressed up, you know. It's only toad in the hole. What do you mean? This is my dress uniform. It's my regimental dinner tonight. For the survivors of the Battle of Omdurman. Well, I hope they're not eating it here, otherwise there won't be any survivors. I'm going up to London. Omdurman, do you say, Jones? Yes, sir. It's the 42nd annual reunion of the veterans of the Battle of Omdurman. Oh, I see. I served with distinction in that campaign, sir. I should have been mentioned in dispatches, but I think they ran out of paper. Stop <laughs> up, Jones. That was the last time a great cavalry charge was ever made by the British Army. I can remember as if it was yesterday. We were situated between two huge rocks, say for sake of argument, at these salt and pepper pots. Right, right now, our General Kitchener was here. That, that's this bottle of brown sauce. 
<laughs> and the Mad Marty was... No, hold on, the brown sauce had better be the Mad Marty. <laughs> what a minute. On account he was brown, you see, so... <laughs> General Ketchner, he better be this bottle of tomato sauce. Him having a sort of florid complexion. <laughs> you with me, sir? Yeah, I think so, General, yeah. Right, so here he was between the salt and the pepper, and here at the head of his army was the Mad Marty. If you ask me, it wasn't only the Mardi who was mad. I was uh, past the mustard pot, Joe, will you? Well, here it comes. No, it's not hard. No. Now, I, I, impersonated by this pot of mustard, was here, right next to the pepper. I wasn't on my own, of course. There was other troops around me, and suddenly a trumpet blew. <laughs> <laughs> Who's telling this story, Pikey? Sorry, Mr. Jones. Anyway, me? thousands of screaming dervishes came charging straight at us. Steady, boys, Kitchener said. Don't fire till you see the reds of their eyes. I thought he always said the whites of their eyes. Yes, he did, only he shouldn't have, you see, because all that sand flying about made them very bloodshot. <laughs> Get a lot of bloodshot eyes in the desert, sir. I don't mean they're actually lying around on their own, of course. Oh. They're attached to people, you know, sir. Get on with it, Joe. All day long they charged us, and every time we beat them back, those dervishes kept coming at us with great big choppers, chopping heads off left, right and centre. You never saw anything like it. There was blood and chopped up limbs everywhere. You're right, sir. You've gone a bit pale. A bit airless in here, that's yeah. all. The corpses was piled up eight foot high, and the air was heavy with the stench of death. Oh, oh you don't get battles like that nowadays. <laughs> well, I'll leave you to enjoy your dinner, Mr. Manley. <laughs> See you all tomorrow. Cheerio. Well, after that, I seem to have lost my appetite. Yes, so have I, Wilson. Here, you lot want afters? Tapioca and prunes? Oh... Come in. Oh, excuse me, sir. Yes, Wilson, what is it? Fraser's waiting outside with the new recruit he's recommended. Oh, right. Bring them in. All right, sir. All right, Fraser, you can bring your friend in now. Hi. Good evening, Cop Manning. Good evening, Fraser. I'd like to introduce Mr. George Clark. He wants to join our ranks. Good evening, Mr. Clark. Good evening, Clark! <laughs> ah, now, I'd hazard a guess, Mr. Clark, that you'd served in the army before. That is correct, Clark! I thought so. I'm a, I'm a pretty shrewd judge of these things. <laughs> now, Fraser, have you, uh, you've known Mr. Clark for some time? I sir. I have that. Would you say he was a man of integrity? Oh, yes, sir, and very generous, too. He bought me several drinks in the bar of the Anchor last Thursday night. When did you say you first met Mr. Clark? In the bar of the Anchor last Thursday night. <laughs> yes. Well, Mr. Clark, perhaps you'd like to tell us something about yourself. Yes, sir. <clears throat> well, as you so shrewdly guess, sir, I've been a regular soldier all my life. I retired about ten years ago, and I came to live in Warmington only a few weeks ago. When did you first join the army? Oh, back in 1897, sir. And a year later, I served under General Kitchener at the Battle of Omdurman. <laughs> Great, sir, what a coincidence. Uh, yes, indeed. Jones was up in London for the reunion dinner, only last night. <laughs> you uh, didn't by any chance come across the last Corporal Jones, did you? Oh, there were thousands of men in that battle, sir. You can't expect me to remember that. No, 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 no. of course, I was only joking. What regiment were you in? The Warwickshire, sir. Wasn't Jones in the Warwickshire regiment, sir? Yes, yes, he was, Wilson. Hold on, sir. As a matter of fact, come to think of it, I do remember one Jones. He was always just that bit behind everyone else with his drill. That's <laughs> <laughs> him, all right. He wasn't a lance corporal, though. Uh -huh. No, he was just an ordinary private. Did you hear that, Captain Man? Just an ordinary private, not a lance corporal. I don't always knew it. I always knew it. All right, all right, all right, <laughs> Fraser. Well, we'll just have to wait until Jones gets here to find out if it's the same man. I don't know the same man. Not my words. Yeah, that'll be all. Thank you, Fraser. You can go now. Very good. Oh, 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 oh sorry, Mr. Fraser. Look what you're going, Godfrey. <laughs> yes, Godfrey, what is it? Uh, I've been looking at a uniform for our new recruit, sir. A little premature of you, Godfrey. Still, you might as well try it on him. Oh, thank you, sir. Here you are, Mr. Clark. But you don't know my measurements. Oh, I don't need them. 
You've only got as large or small. <laughs> Godfrey. That blouse doesn't fit very well. Can't you find you a better one than that? That's the best I can do, I'm afraid, sir. The crust is rather an awkward shape. It's not me. You've left the anger in the jacket. <laughs> well, it looked a bit odd. I must have you smartly dressed, Clark. This is a highly efficient unit, you know. When do I start training, sir? Oh, there's no time for all that. You just have to pick it up as you go along. <laughs> no, no, no. I keep telling you, Joe, this new chap, Clark, says that he knew Jones in the Sudan. Eh? Blimey. That was seen in 1800 and frozen to death. I mean, how can, we, how can he be sure after all these years? He says that Jones he knew was always a beat behind everybody else when they were drilling. Now, that still doesn't prove anything, Mr. Fraser. Well, good evening, everybody. Hello, Jonesy. You look a bit rough. How did the reunion of the Battle of Omdi Bum Bum go, then? <laughs> Omdi Bum, if you don't mind. Blimey. You look as if you and your mates fought them whirling dervishes all over again. Well, I had a very nice time, as it so happens. You were drunk, were you? Drunk? No, I wasn't drunk. We just had a convivial evening, that's all. <laughs> well, Captain Manning wants to see you in his office. Oh, right now, Jock. Well, I'll go now, then. Come on, boys. This is something I didn't want to miss. <laughs> Come in. Lance Corporal Jones to see you, sir. All right, Jock. I don't need to be shown into the office. Good evening, sir. Good evening, Jones. I've got someone here I want you to meet. Our new recruit. Private Clark. How do you do? Hello, Jonesy. Remember me? No. <laughs> I'm afraid I don't think I do. Of course you do. One, four, seven, eight, nine. Private clock. Oh, yeah. Hello, Nobby. <laughs> Hello, mate. Long time no see, eh? Yeah, long time. You remember me now, don't you? Oh, yeah, I remember. And I remember you, mate. I remember you very well. Yes, well, well I think it's time for the parade, sir. I'll, I'll go and fall the men in, shall I? Good idea, Wilson. All right, sir. Come along, Jones. Come on. Yeah, come in, Sergeant Wilson. Private Clark, you come with me. I'll introduce you to the rest of the platoon. Very good. <laughs> Is that Warman Denancy 223? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, Charles Godfrey speaking. Hello, Charles. It's James here. Who? James. James Fraser. Oh, oh good evening, Mr. Fraser. Hey, I've got a, a wee bit of news for you, man. I took that chap Clark out for a drink tonight. Well, when he had bought me a couple of pints, I asked him straight out what happened between him and Jones. Oh, dear. Uh, uh, was that proper? Mm, he was a bit easy, but reading between the lines and putting two and two together, it seemed that the pair of them were on patrol and he got captured. Jones managed to escape and he left pair old Clark in the desert to die. Oh, I can't believe that, uh. I've known Mr. Jones for such a long time, and he's won all those medals. He couldn't have won them if he was a car, could he? Well, of course, there may not be any truth in it, but as I always say, there's no smoke without fire. No smoke without fire. Ah, oh, Doris. Oh, is it time to open up yet, Mr. Jones? No, not quite. I just finished cutting these chops. Oh, here's the post. There's three letters for you, Mr. Jones. Oh, thank you, Doris. Uh, uh, could do me a favour and go and get the offal from the cold room, will you? Uh, yes, of course, Mr. Jones. Yep, now then. Hello. What's this? A white feather? Must be a circular from the Poulterers Association. <laughs> <laughs> now, let me see. Why did you leave your friend in the desert to die? Hey, What are they talking about? Might at least have signed it. Now, I wonder who this one's from. Hello? Another white fella. There's no room in Warmington for a coward. That's not signed either. I was always taught it was rude to send unanimous letters. <laughs> well, I suppose I'd better open this one. Now then. A coward like you is not even worth a whole white feather. So I'm only sending you half a one. <laughs> Right, that's it. 
That's the last feather. Doris! Yes, Mr. Jones, what is it? I want you to look after the shop for me. There's something I've got to do. There's something I should have done a long time ago, Doris. A very, very long time ago, Doris. You know, Wilson, I just can't fathom this Jones business. Still no sign of him, I suppose. No, sir. He he just disappeared from his shop two days ago and hasn't been seen since. Whole platoon's falling to pieces, Wilson. Oh, I wouldn't go as far as that, sir. I used to look forward to coming on duty, you know. Mm Hmm, did you? Look forward to the comradeship, the cheerful banter, the feeling of being banded together for a common cause. And now it's all turned sour. I even said to Jones, do you deny this rumour that you left Clark in the desert to die? But he refused to say anything. Yes, I know. That's the puzzling thing. Well, I'm not having this cloud hanging over the platoon any longer. Get the men in, Wilson. I'm going to get to the bottom of this. All right, sir. Would you all like to come in, please? Who's your hand? Good evening, Captain right. Mannering. Good evening, Captain Mannering. Good evening, Fraser. Walker. Good evening, Mr. Mannering. Good evening, Tom. Good evening, Clark. Now, men, as you all know, Corporal Jones disappeared two days ago and has not been seen since. Here. Yeah. You don't think he's done himself in, do you? No, I do not think so, Walker. I saw a film once called Disgrace to the Regiment. <laughs> yes. And everyone thought this man was a coward. So they left him alone in a room with a revolver on the table. What happened, son? Did the corporal shoot himself? Oh, he wasn't a corporal. He was a captain. (laughs) (laughs) Stupid boy. (laughs) All right, Clark. Now, suppose you tell us exactly what did happen in the desert between you and Jones. Well, sir, uh, 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 it was like this, sir. Jones and me was on patrol, and we was captured by the dervishes. They pegged me out in a sand, but Jones begged for mercy, and so they took him with them. Well, he managed to escape somehow, but he never came back for me, sir. He just left me there to die. I must have passed out, but I can vaguely remember a native bending over me and going through me pockets. When I came to, I was in hospital. That native must have saved my life, even if he did pinch me wallet. I've had it very hard to believe that Jones would have left you to die. Well, why has he cleared off then, sir? I'll tell you why I cleared off. Ah, Jones, where have you been? Permission to speak, sir. I'd like to thank you for having faith in me. Up till this moment, my lips have been sealed. And now, in the fullness of time, I can expose myself. (laughs) This is really what happened. It all took place a few days before the Battle of Omdurman. Private Clark and me was part of a patrol sent out by General Kitchener. It was under the command of Colonel Smythe, a tall and resolute man who scarcely spoke a word. He was not unlike you to look at, Mr. Wilson. Oh, really, was he? Yeah. There was another officer with him, Second Lieutenant Franklin. He was the Colonel's nephew. Now I come to think of it, he was a spitting image of you, Pikey. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. <laughs> there was also a young cockney, Private Green, who kept our spirits up with jokes and merry quips. Don't tell me. He looked just like me. Well, now you come to mention it, he did. And there was a sergeant, a nasty, coarse fellow, kept giving us the rough side of his tongue. You know, Captain Manning, in a certain light... Yeah, yeah, just get on with the story, Joe. Yes, sir, very good, sir. Well... Anyway, there we was, on patrol, patrol, slowly moving into mad Mardi country. I knew the patrol was doomed from the start. As I looked up, I could see vultures wheeling overhead, waiting to pick our bones. Keep your eyes peeled, lads. This is ideal ambush country. Excuse me, Sergeant. What is it, Corporal? There's someone up ahead. Arms for the love of Allah. Arms for the love of Allah. Uh, only an old fakir. <laughs> Take no notice of him. Yalla. Turn back, English ones. Turn back. It is written in the sand that before the sun sets, all of you will be dead. Be a good chap, with you, and clear out of the way. You heard what the colonel said, old man. Him sheep. <laughs> the curse of the prophet Mustafa be upon you. And you, Sergeant, may all your hair fall out. (laughs) Too late, mate. (laughs) Uncle Colonel? 
I've told you not to call me that on duty, Mr. Franklin. Sorry, sir. Well, what is it you wish to say? Well, I don't like it, Colonel Arthur. It's too quiet. Oh, rubbish. Nonsense, Lieutenant. Nonsense. You worry too much. All right, take cover, James. Take cover. Take cover. Take cover. Ah! Ah! Hey, Corporal, the ah. Lieutenant's been hit. Ah. <laughs> Lieutenant, Lieutenant. Mm. <laughs> it's all right, sir. It's Corporal Jones here. Are you hurt bad? Oh, it's nothing, Corporal. Only a shattered leg. <laughs> Keep your heads down. Blimey, Sergeant, look, there's thousands of them. Shut up, Private Green. Keep your head down. Colonel, sir, I don't like the look of this. Them <laughs> dervishes mean business. Yes, it looks awfully like it, Sergeant. I tell you what, as soon as it's dark, we better send someone for help. Permission to speak, sir? Yes, Corporal Jones. I'd like to volunteer to be the summoner to go and help as soon as it's dark. Oh, very well, Jones. You better take Private Clark with you. Very good, sir. Very good, sir. So I said, very good, sir. And Clark and me managed to creep out during the night, and the next morning we were on our way for help. Oh, isn't it exciting, Mr. Mannering? <laughs> it's just like a story I once read in the Hotspur. Be quiet, Frank. <laughs> go on, Jones. Well, sir, we was making our way along a wadi, but quite unbeknownst to us, we was being watched by four nasty savage eyes. They belonged to two of the dirtiest dervishes in the desert. <laughs> the wazir El Frazier and his henchman El Hodge. <laughs> <laughs> laughing at us, they must have been laughing at us. <laughs> Do you see what I see, El Hodge, down in the wadi? Yeah. Right, pair of hooligans, by Allah. Let us have some sport with them, shall we? Whatever you say, Frazier. All right, charge! Ah! Oh, what's that, Corporal Jones? There's two horrible dervishes descending on us. Don't panic, don't panic! <laughs> Stay where you are, you two. Do not move, or I will shoot you on the spot. You heard what the wazir said. Stay where you are. I wasn't going to move. I'm not frightened of you, you know. Ah, oh, the little one has spirit. Yeah, he's a cheeky little infidel. Oh, I beg of you, please don't hurt me. I haven't done nothing. Please, please don't hurt me. I'm pleading on my knees. Oh, he's a right little pleader. <laughs> Get up, Private Clark. Stop groveling. Remember, you're a British soldier. I don't care. Oh, please don't hurt me, was he, huh? I'll tell you anything you want to know. Anything, only please don't hurt me. Silence, yes. dog! Yes, sir. Anything you say, sir. What shall we do with them, El Frazier? We shall get no sport from this snivelling son of a Jesse. <laughs> Stick him out of the sand and let the vultures pick his bones. <laughs> right you are. Oh, no! No! <laughs> no! Be quiet, Private Clark, or they might turn nasty. <laughs> El Hodge, yeah. tie this one up. We must eat. Light a fire. Oh, blimey. <laughs> Don't worry, infidel. We've got something else for supper. <laughs> We've made that fire too big, Frazier. The British will be able to see it for miles. Worrying, El Hodge, and pass me another sheep's eye. Oh, there aren't any more left. Huh? Anyway, you've had enough. What? You dare to tell El Fazir that he's had enough? You flat nosed son of a camel? Oh. Well, if you're going to get personal, you, you hook nosed offspring of a goat, why, you seller of vegetables, I shall stick you on my dagger like a roast chicken. No, no will you? We'll soon see about that. <laughs> Well, suddenly the one that called himself Wazir Frazier broke away and jumped on his horse and made off into the night. Suddenly the Wazir wasn't here. <laughs> anyway, that only left El Hodge, so I grabbed a flaming torch from the fire and shoved it right in front of his face, because they don't like fire dervishes, don't you know? The effect was amazing. He turned from a proud warrior into a gibbering idiot. Oh, you've gone mad. What do you think you're doing? 
Stop waving that flaming torch about! <laughs> you should have seen him. His face was controverted with fear, and he screamed, Omkayaya! Oh, Omkayaka! What's that mean, Mr. Jones? It's Arabic for put that light out. <laughs> Anyway, I didn't completely at my mercy, so I took his robes, put them on, jumped on his horse and rode off to rescue Private Clark. But when I got back to him, I thought he was a goner. So I took his wallet out of his tunic. Why did you do that, Jones? Well, I thought I'd send it home with his personal effects. I see. I opened his wallet and inside I saw something that made my blood run cold. And that, Mr. Manning, takes a lot of doing in that heat. <laughs> Whatever was it, Jersey? It was a photograph of the Colonel's lady. Now, the colonel, sir, was a very upstanding gentleman, but his wife hadn't been quite so upstanding. <laughs> More down line, if you take me. <laughs> she and Private Clark had been... Well, I couldn't believe it. What's Mr. Jones mean, Uncle Arthur? <laughs> I'll tell you when you're a bit older, Frank. <laughs> Suddenly, Private Clark gave a low moan. I realised he wasn't dead after all. Well, to cut a long story short, I managed to get him back to the hospital at headquarters, and I never saw him again until last week, and all these years I've kept that secret locked between my bosoms. <laughs> what secret? Ah, oh, well, you see, Pike, the Colonel's missus and private... Walk up, walk up. Don't you tell this boy anything. <laughs> but Jones, why on earth didn't you tell us all this before? I couldn't, sir. You see, I thought the Colonel and his wife might still be alive. That's why I've been away for the past two days. I've been up in London going through the records in Somerset House. And I'm pleased to say, sir, that the Colonel and his lady have gone to that big parade ground in the sky where the breath of scandal can no longer touch them. And I carried this photograph and some letters from her that I found in Private Clark's wallet all these years. Well, I think the best thing you can do with those, Jones, is to burn them. And I'm very sorry about all this. Speaking of for myself, Jones here, I always thought it'd be something like this, son. I never doubted you for a minute, not for a single minute. <laughs> the moving finger writes, and having writ moves on. <laughs> What's that got to do with it? Well, uh, I don't know, really. It just sounded rather, rather appropriate. <laughs> just a minute. Where's Clark? He slipped out a few seconds ago, sir, through the side door. Well, quick. We must get after him. Come on, men. Follow me. What? Hey, hey, who do you think you're pushing? What's the hurry, Napoleon? Forgotten your sweet ration? <laughs> All right, you, Rogers. Did you see a man come out of here about two minutes ago? Yeah, he was rushing towards the station. Said he had to catch the last train to London. We'll get him. Come on. I shouldn't bother. He gave me a message for you. I'm to tell you he's very sorry. He's had to resign. He'll post the uniform back to you. He can't do that. He's not worth bothering about Mr. Mannering. Let him go. Ah, I forget him. Look, Jonesy, just burn that photo and all those letters. Then we can forget about the whole thing. Here, here's a light. Have you gone mad? What do you think you're doing? Stop waving that thing about like a flaming torch. Oh, shut up. Right, Joe, hold it steady. Didn't you hear me? Did you hear what I said? Put that light out! <laughs> Put that bloody light out! <laughs> that episode of Dad's Army, based on the original television series by Jimmy Perry and David Croft, you heard Arthur Lowe's Captain Mannering, John LaMeasure as Sergeant Wilson, Clive Dunn, Corporal Jones... John Laurie, Private Fraser, Arnold Ridley, Private Godfrey, Ian Lavender, Private Pike, Bill Pertwee, Chief Warden Hodges, Michael Bates, Mr. Clark, Larry Martin, Private Walker, and Avril Angos as Edna. The Two and a Half Feathers was adapted for radio by Michael Knowles and Harold Snowd and produced...